Right, okay, so I'm Susan Simmons and I'm an engagement officer for Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Um, and the Wildlife Trust manage around about 50 nature reserves across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And we give advice on other bits and pieces of land and we've worked um, educating people for around about 60 years actually, doing all of this work in, in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, and today we are obviously here for um, looking at how we can make our school grounds a little wilder. So the learning outcomes for today. Now, also, if you're not, if you don't know, you can actually drag the little icons with the people in away from the text if it's in your way, which I've just done. So, so the learning outcomes for today are for us to be able to map and identify the best areas to use for outdoor learning and wildlife habitats in your school grounds. We're gonna be able to suggest some easy, low cost ideas that you could do with your class to improve your school grounds for wildlife and also be able to assess and minimize the impact of outdoor learning on the natural environment as well as promoting environmental awareness as part of the outdoor learning. So I've got lots of slides with lots of ideas to show you today. Um, and as I say, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'm really happy for you to interrupt me or wait till the end if you prefer. There is a little chat box so you can put something in there which we can have a look at at the end um, or just shout at me, that's absolutely fine. So. Basically, in terms of wildlife, we really need bigger, better, more joined up places. We need space for wildlife to survive. And school grounds play a really good part in this because we can link up, join up some of those dots by managing our school grounds. And obviously they are, it's also really, really beneficial for learning. And there are a lot of different ways that we can do this. So school grounds can actually offer habitats in the way of food, shelter, nests and water. So they can offer habitats for local wildlife. And we will look at this in a little bit more detail as we go on. So in terms of food, we can offer nectar and pollen, seed heads as the autumn winter progresses, fruit in the autumn as well, the stems and the leaves of the plants are really useful for a range of insects and other animals as well. We can put up artificial feeders and also, you know, if we attract all of these insects, then we're going to attract small mammals and birds of prey. So we'll have hopefully a whole food chain in, in the uh, school grounds. So in terms of shelter and nest, um, areas like longer grass or dense planting can be really useful for this. A native hedge can provide a fantastic habitat and provide plenty of food throughout the year and some shelter and some nest areas as well. Mature trees are really, really good. Deadwood, hollow stems and obviously artificial nest boxes. And we can also look at making artificial bug hotels like this lovely one in the picture and they don't need to be that big you can make very very small ones so what i want to do today is just to run through some of the different habitats that you could provide in the school grounds and have a look at some really easy options so looking at some of the really small things that you can do moving up to some of the slightly larger things so we'll have a look we'll start off maybe with water because ponds are actually really, really important for wildlife. Now, if you didn't want to provide a pond, you could think about just a boggy area. Um, and also it doesn't need to be a large pond. It could just simply be a washing up bowl sunk into the ground, a very, very small area of water. And it can be used for bathing and for drinking by birds and small mammals. So before we look at what we might do, the first thing I guess really is to look at the school grounds and to sort of map what you've got there. And this is a really good opportunity to involve the pupils and in fact the whole school community. So what you want to do is have a look around the school grounds 
think about whether the ground is free draining, whether it's boggy, whether you've got any particular wet areas. And that obviously might be a good spot for you to put your pond or your or your bog garden. Um, think about the aspect. So is it sunny or is it shady? Are there any particularly shady spots? You may not want to put a pond in where it's very, very shady because you may end up with lots of leaf litter falling in. So it would be important to consider the location. Have a think about the soil, because if you're going to plant some wildflowers, for example, you might need to know whether you've got very chalky soil or whether it's a little bit more acidic. Good thing to do is to find out what's already there. So if you're thinking of creating a little wildflower meadow, first of all, we would always suggest letting it grow long and seeing what you've already got, because you might be surprised there might be some nice things there already. And the children can help with the surveys, with doing some identification to find out what's already in the ground. And then having a think about which areas particularly work well and which areas don't work so well. So, for example, there might be areas that you just never use, and that might be because they need something doing to make them a little bit more user friendly. So part of your sort of mapping would be having a look at what works and what doesn't. And then you need to think about what you're aiming for. You know, do you have an idea in mind what it is you'd like to create, what changes you might like to make? And then it's quite nice to produce a little map. So there's an example of one just here in the picture. It's quite a nice thing for the children to do, to produce a map of what you've already got and then have a think about where you might make some changes. So there's a lot of words in this slide, I know. Don't worry about writing this all down because I'm very happy to send these slides to you afterwards. I generally do that via WeTransfer, which is free, easy to use. You don't need to download anything. You just open it up. Um, if you don't want it, then maybe just put that in the chat. Otherwise, I'll assume that you would like to receive these slides. So these are just a few ideas of how you might involve the children with this site survey. You know, they can help with measuring perimeters, calculating areas. They can be doing some soil samples and seeing what kind of soil type you have. They might like to measure the microclimate. They could find out where the nice sunny spots are, where the windy spots are. Um, you know, surveying which areas are the most popular for the children to use when they're supervised and unsupervised. You know, there's a whole lot of things on this list that the children could potentially help with in working out what's already there and what we might be able to do to improve this for wildlife. So if we start off looking at ponds, ponds, as I said just now, really important for wildlife. They've declined by 50% in the 20th century. So a lot of them have been filled in, we've lost them, they've disappeared. And they actually support two thirds of freshwater species. So if you're gonna make one change for wildlife, then really the best thing you can do is to create a pond. So what makes a good wildlife pond? Well, I could ask you for ideas. If anybody wants to shout out, feel free or put something in the chat. Any ideas what might make a good wildlife pond? No, no, not putting fish in it. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Not putting fish in it. Yeah, I would agree because they do tend to eat lots of things. Um, yes, a whole range of plants, a variety of plants, shade and sunny spots. Yep, yeah, places for animals to climb out. Yep, yeah, brilliant. So a lovely variety of plants, oxygenators, marginal plants, as you've said, Amy, for, pe for the animals to climb up out of. Different levels. Yep, yeah, definitely. Nice to have varying depths and points that um, creatures can get out of. So good access. Yes, brilliant. Good access for things like hedgehogs and for birds. So yeah, all of those things are really, really important. Native plants, brilliant. Yep, yeah, I always say native because sometimes some of the non-native plants that you can buy for ponds can be really invasive and can take over your pond. So 
and also native plants our native wildlife has evolved with our native plants over a long long time so i would always say to go for native plants because they will be really beneficial for our insects something that doesn't dry out yep yeah, absolutely and clearing out the algae that's a good point quite often when you first put in a pond you will get an algae an algal bloom and that does generally subside so it, it's usually as a result of nutrients. So you don't want to add nutrients. So often tap water, for example, might encourage that buildup of algae. So if you can try and fill it with rainwater, that's brilliant. Um, and not to put in lots of um, soil that would be high in nutrients as well. So, so that helps to get rid of that algal bloom. Oh, just admitting a couple of people. Uh, there we go just let in a couple more people okay so moving on to the next slide so yes yeah, so creating a pond so it doesn't need to be huge at all as you can see from this picture it can be really small and it can just be like a little washing up bowl actually um so the things that you just need to consider if you're creating a pond would be lining it and filling it this pond in this picture is um, lined with a butyl liner, which is very flexible. Um, it's got quite, it usually comes with a guarantee of about 25 years, I believe. So that's pretty good, but there's various types of liner that you can purchase. Filling it, as I said, if you can use rainwater, then that is ideal. It's nice to have a variation of depths if possible, because different creatures will be within different parts of the pond. Some will prefer the deeper parts, but it's really important to have a lot of nice shallow water because that warms up quite nicely and you will find lots of creatures in that nice warm shallow water when the sun is out. Um, access, we've mentioned it's really important to have good access. So maybe like a beach area, for creatures to get in and out and some nice shelving. Native planting we've mentioned and a variety of plants, some oxygenators perhaps in the middle that will help to keep it nice and full of oxygen and nice and clear and then some lovely marginals around the outside where those dams or fly nymphs will be able to crawl up and shed their skin and turn into adults. It's good to have a think about any adjacent habitat to link it up if possible with other wild areas. If possible, it's nice to have perhaps the back of the pond as a sort of um, no-go area so that you've definitely got a sort of non-intervention safe space, if you like, for the wildlife to head over to if they want to escape. Um, and the location. So we tend not to want to put them where it's very, very shaded it's probably a good idea to have it in a nice sunny spot if you can. And there's just a nice sort of cross section here to show you that if you can have a bit, a deep bit in the middle, then that can be beneficial for some creatures. If not, it's really good to have a lot of shallow water, um, which gets nice and warm and nice, easy access that we've mentioned, not too shaded. Um, yeah, so I think we've mentioned those. Obviously, you'd need to consider health and safety in school grounds, so it would need to be closed off um, and only supervised access. But it can be really, really beneficial, um, attracting lots of wildlife and a great opportunity for learning, for having a look at classification of creatures and life cycles and all sorts of really, really nice science subjects there. Uh, native planting, yep, yeah, so we've mentioned this, we've got some water mint in the middle there with a damselfly, I think, a tiny damselfly I can see in the picture. Um, purple loose strife there on the right, and the picture on the left just shows a nice sort of beach area. Um, so yeah, and some nice, and also a nice log pile or rock pile um, next to the pond is really important because some of the amphibians, for example, might want to sort of be under there, hibernate under there over winter. So it's quite nice to have that next to the pond as well. And there we go. So there's a very, very small version. So as I say, we can't all go out and dig a pond. It's quite a big thing to do. Um, so if you can't do that, 
then you can just use a small watertight container and you can create your own mini wildlife pond, which would be fantastic for the children to help with. Um, and these sorts of projects could potentially be carried out in, in a school, after school club, you know, if there's a sort of wildlife club, maybe that sort of thing, um, then that might be an opportunity to create something like this. So this just shows really that even a small container can attract wildlife. This is one of the wildlife watch activity sheets, and there are lots and lots of these which you can get hold of online, um, which I'll show you a couple more today, but there are many of these. They're really, really nice activities that you can do with children. So you'll see with this, it's just really important to have this access. We've got these rocks and this log so that creatures can get in and out if you're using a small one. Anybody got any questions at all so far? If you're using a washing up bowl, could you still include some plants? So yes, yes, as you can see on this picture, um, there are a few plants in there. So yeah, absolutely. In fact, when um, I first created a pond many, many years ago, I initially was so worried about introducing too much soil and too many nutrients and getting that algae, algal bloom that I just put my plants in there to start with in pots um, and used um, very low nutrient pond soil at the time. So it sort of stopped everything from taking over. So you could certainly put a plant, you know, in a pot in your small container here. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, just having a look for any questions. Um, so Claire says, your school are reluctant to go down a pond route because of risk assessments, etc. We're in a very urban environment. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, the schools that I've been to that have ponds, they, they have it obviously enclosed and locked um at all times and children can only go down there supervised with an with an adult um and they do obviously have risk assessments and so on i don't know how how else really to persuade you know your school to do it other than that the benefits are huge if they're able to um build a pond and keep it secure then it would be a great thing to do um so we, we, I can't quite, sorry, can't quite need school, Andrew. It's the learning thing. Didn't quite get all of that. Couple of special needs school. Okay, you're a special needs school. So yeah, so it's great, great, certainly a really, really good um, learning experience, you know, and I always say to people that um, when you take children outside, quite often when I've been taking a group of children outside quite often the teacher might say to me quietly you know that that child over there is the one to watch they they might be difficult they've got behavior problems and so on and you know what it's nearly always that child that absolutely loves it and becomes so engaged in what you're doing outside it just brings brings children alive particularly those children that perhaps are not so academic and aren't suited to sort of sitting in front of the whiteboard for hours on end once they're outside looking at these creatures and sorting them and counting the numbers of legs and putting them into groups, they just become, you know, very, very much engaged in my experience. So a pond is really valuable or even just a small container like this. Now, um, so yeah, I think we've just got a couple of pictures of some pond wildlife. I'm just dragging this this out of the way so I can see what I've got there. Oh yeah, I've got little newt on the right hand side and a damselfly and lots of frog spawn, which we should be seeing quite soon actually. Uh, in fact, in some areas, I think people are already seeing frog spawn. Um, native hedgerows. So again, we can't all put in a great big hedgerow, you know, because it takes up quite a bit of space, but many school grounds have already got hedges around the outside and some of them perhaps could do with a little bit of restoration. So maybe putting some native shrubs in any gaps that are there, maybe doing a bit of coppicing if it's got very, very old and leggy, um, or if there is a space to put a small hedge line,
then again, it's very easy to do. You can buy very small sort of 30, 40 centimeter whips um, of native shrubs and you can pop those in the ground relatively easy. Um, and I would suggest using species that occur in the local area. Um, so have a look at the soil type, have a look at what else is, is occurring in the local area. Um, it's always good to get native plants from local of local provenance so that you know what you are planting. And again, they will be the most beneficial to wildlife. Um, and you just would really tend to put them in a in sort of a double staggered row, about 30 centimetres apart each plant. Um, and it can be if you just get little plug plants root trainers, we call them for the shrubs. They're very, very easy to plant. And then you might need to protect them from being nibbled by rabbits or deer perhaps. So, so hedgerows, not everyone's got space I know, but native hedgerows are really, really great um, because you know they provide flowers. So this is just hawthorn on the left there. They'll provide flowers with, with pollen and nectar. And then later in the year, they'll be providing fruits and nuts. And obviously they also provide great cover um, and places for birds to nest and small mammals and so on. So really, really beneficial. And going back to the pond briefly, there are several schools I've come across that do have a pond, but it's just been neglected for years. So in that instance, again, you could potentially get a little work party in normal times together of, sometimes parents are quite happy to come in at a weekend and you can quite quickly with a little bit of um, sort of human power you can quite quickly renovate an old pond and maybe also an old hedgerow as well if it needs it so another really beneficial habitat um, and that's just you know pretty pictures really of birds to show you the sorts of things that you might be able to encourage um, with some of these habitats that we might be able to put in. And invertebrates, a whole range of invertebrates. And you would be amazed at the different, you know, the numbers of different species you can attract from planting a few more native plants in your garden or your school grounds. So I wanted to have a look at wildflowers. Um, now we can talk about wildflower meadows but not many people obviously are gonna be able to put in a whole meadow, but we could consider a border, making a wildflower border or a very sort of tiny corner of um, the school grounds. You could perhaps think about making a very small meadow or alternatively, we can just think about the sorts of things we could put in pots and containers because even pots and containers or window boxes, they can all be really useful for wildlife depending on what we put in those things and this picture really just demonstrates um, towards the end I've got some before and after pictures actually of this garden is a very tiny space and it really just shows you what you can do in a very tiny space really a nice little wildflower area and lots of sort of pots and containers down the side there so if you're thinking about a wildflower area to start with, and if you know some schools are lucky enough to have sort of slightly more wild areas that they might want to turn over to a sort of wildflower section. To start with, as I said earlier, it's always best to leave it uncut for a while and survey it. Have a look and see what you've already got. Get the children involved, get some nice ID guides and have a look and see what plants you might already have because you might already have some nice plants there. And then have a think about the size and have a think about what it is you'd like to do if you didn't have very much come up and you've not got much in the way of wildflowers then there are a few options you might consider plug plants you could get some wildflower plug plants and you could pop those in you might consider removing some small turfs taking out some turf and putting some seed in those bare patches the other option here that I've listed overseeding, what this is, is when you cut the grass very, very short and you scarify the ground so that you've got quite a lot of bare patches there and you then sow seed into that. But you do need to cut it short before you do that because otherwise, 
and get some bare ground. Otherwise, those seeds will just be swamped by the grass that's already there. I mean, the ideal option is to remove the topsoil and seed into bare ground, because actually what you want is low nutrients. So that's the reason for getting rid of topsoil, because the nutrients just encourage those more competitive species that we don't particularly want, some of the tougher grasses and thistles and nettles. But if we don't have many nutrients, then some of those more delicate wildflowers have the opportunity to come up through. And I've mentioned using something called yellow rattle because that is actually a lovely wildflower and it's semi-parasitic. So it actually lives off the roots of grasses and it suppresses the grass growth, which allows the wildflowers a chance to come up through. So yellow rattle is a nice native wildflower to plant if you want to create a wildflower meadow. So I'm just going to check in the chat. Is there a list of native plants that are safe for use in areas? Oh, okay, now that's a good question. Because um, you're redeveloping your outdoor area, right? And you'd like to include a natural roof on some of the storage areas. That's a really good idea. Um, that is a very good question. I don't know of a list that actually says alongside them whether they are poisonous or not poisonous. So. I'm going to provide some lists in a moment, actually, of some wildflowers that are really good to use, but I'd suggest I haven't put next to them whether they're poisonous or not. So it would just be a case of looking them up to see whether they are. So for example, with the native trees and shrubs, the one that springs to mind that I would definitely not have in a school ground would be yew, because that's very, very poisonous. Um, and spindle, I wouldn't have that either. So. I would suggest that you probably look look them up just to check whether they are poisonous or not. I mean, it's a good question and I will look up whether there is a list um, that tells you whether they're poisonous or not. So, okay. And there's, let's just see another question. Thank you, okay. You can get a book. Yeah, I'm sure. I don't know the name of a book, but and I think there are certain websites as well that will tell you if, if things are poisonous. Um, I don't think though the list that we provide, I don't think they tend to tell you whether they're poisonous or not. Yes, you're right, daffodils are very poisonous um, and foxgloves are very poisonous as well. So there are definitely some poisonous plants about which I wouldn't recommend using. So if you have got this little um, wildflower area, the key really is, is mowing it. Um, so in the first year, we would tend to mow and remove the cuttings every six to eight weeks. And this is just to keep the nutrients down and stop those more competitive species getting up through and remove anything that you don't want in there. And then in the second year, you would then just mow it um, once a year generally really and remove those cuttings and the timing would depend on when your flowers generally flowered and set seed so for spring flowering meadows you wouldn't mow it until after midsummer and then you could mow it more regularly in the autumn but for the summer flowering meadows you wouldn't mow it from june right up until late um, autumn so and and it's nice to leave the hay on the ground for a few days in case there are any seeds in there that might then drop into the turf and then remove because you're removing those nutrients. So that's if you've got the space for a sort of wildflower meadow. Um, but as I said, we don't have to have a meadow to have plants that will attract wildlife. Um, so I know that some schools are lucky enough to have one or two trees around and the hedgerows as well. Fruit trees are fantastic for bees. So these are a, this is a list here of plants that would be good for bees. And you'll see that early in the year, we've got quite a few fruit trees on that list, which are really, really good for bees. You'll see we've got things like primroses and dandelions. I love dandelions. This last year during lockdown, when we were all at home, I spent a lot more time than usual just observing my garden and I discovered just how many species love dandelions 
And on us, he had orange tip butterflies, brimstone butterflies, several different species of solitary bee, honeybee, bumblebee, and I'm sure there are more, all feeding on dandelions. So I would say just plain old dandelions are absolutely brilliant for wildlife. And then obviously you've got the dandelion seeds that you can blow, you know, um, and they're really good for goldfinches and for birds like that to feed on the seed heads later on in the year. So just plants like that can be hugely beneficial for our wildlife. Um, so I'm just checking a question. How much access would you say the children would could have to a wild flamander without spoiling it? Yeah, now that's a really good question. Um, and that's one that we're going to have a, a little look at in, in a bit, actually, um, how we can minimise damage to these sites. It will depend a bit, I guess, on the weather. Um, if it's very, very wet, then obviously it would be damaged much more easily. But I guess it would be a case of you monitoring um, how much use it was getting. And I think a case of just keeping your eye on whether you think the use is causing any damage. Um, depends on the size you've got, depends on the area you've got as to whether you could rotate around to different areas. If you've only got a very, very small spot, then perhaps you might suggest that the children look at it from the outside in, if you like, so that they don't trample over it. So it would be a case of monitoring it, I would say, and, depend, and it would depend a bit on the weather and on the size of the area that you've got. But you might just need to put a bit of a, a limit on it. You might need to sort of put in the timetable when certain groups can go out and visit it so it doesn't get overused. So, here, so some of the other things on the list here, you'll notice we've got some nice um, herbs. So if, for example, you don't have very much space and you've just got a small border or some pots, you might want to consider some herbs such as uh, wild marjoram, wild thyme, um, and things like that, which, and sage, things that we can use ourselves maybe in cooking, or as part of a sensory garden. And also those things are really great for wildlife. So they will be really good for attracting butterflies, moths, bees, other insects as well. So that's really nice if you've got a little tiny bit of space where you can put some um, lovely herbs. So there are a few other things you'll see on this list. Quite a lot of flowers, uh, some flowers as well. That's always something nice that people like to grow. Things like teasel are great because they provide lovely seed heads as well, like the sunflowers, once they've finished flowering. So a lot of these things are good when they finish flowering. It's a good idea to leave them <clears throat> and not, um, not cut them down and be tidy, but actually leave them for the birds to come and feed on the seeds. So, so planting for butterflies. So it's really nice if we can have, if we can provide food plants for the larvae, so the caterpillars, as well as the nectar and pollen for the adult butterflies. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of these. Um, the holly blue, now the holly blue, its caterpillars mainly feed on ivy, but also on holly, as the name suggests. And obviously the adults will feed on a lot of those flowers that we've just talked about. And these tend to fly quite early in the year. The orange tip butterfly. Now this is one of my favorites really, because all of these pictures, all of these species in these pictures are actually really, really common. And these, this was all taken in, not the garlic mustard, I have to say, or it is common, but I was going to say it was all taken in my back garden, but the garlic mustard picture wasn't, although I did have garlic mustard in my back garden. So garlic mustard is a very, very common plant that you find on, you know, on the edge of the road, it just grows everywhere. It's edible. It um, has a slight garlic taste, as, as the name suggests, but it's the food plant for the orange tip butterfly. So the orange tip butterfly lays its eggs on the garlic mustard. And this is little orange egg that you can see on that picture there. I took that just with a very cheap, little tiny clip on lens that you can actually clip onto your phone camera and it zooms in really, really close. It's my best buy 
for a long time. So they lay their eggs on this plant and obviously the caterpillars feed on the plant. As the caterpillars get bigger and bigger and bigger, they rest on the seed pods at the top of the plant when they're not feeding. And the adults, you can see in the right hand side, love the dandelions for their nectar and pollen. So, so this is just a very common plant which you could very easily grow, I'm sure. It probably already is growing somewhere under a hedge in the school grounds, maybe just along on, on the roadside, you know. And this is a fairly common butterfly as well. And you can have this whole life cycle going on in the school grounds. You just need to sort of look closely to find some of these things some, sometimes. And I love ivy. Again, it's a really common plant and you've probably got some in the hedge somewhere. If there's a hedge, it's really, really good um, for a whole range of different creatures. So the holly blue butterfly, which is feeding on some apple blossom on that picture on the left, lays its eggs on the ivy, as I mentioned just now. The brimstone butterfly in that middle picture there will hibernate as an adult over winter in amongst the ivy because the ivy is evergreen. It provides cover all year round. So creatures like this will be able to hibernate within it. And then late in the year, when it, all the other flowers have died off, the ivy is still flowering. It's one of the latest plants to flower. So on a warm autumn day, when the sun is out, if you've got some ivy, you will see that it's actually covered, quite often covered in bees, just topping up with their pollen and nectar to get them through the winter before they either die off or hibernate. The bees, the, the honeybees will all, all go into their sort of ball and, and um, hunker down for the winter. So they'll be feeding just before they do that. And ivy is really, really beneficial. So it's great for bats to roost in, it's great for birds to nest in, and it provides berries once the flowers do finish um, quite late into the winter as well. So really, really useful plant to have actually. So a few plants then, um, as I said, I will send this around so you don't need to write them all down. So we've got a few um, flowers that will be maybe useful to think about planting that flower in the spring. I've just listed some here, depending on the soil type that you have. We've got red campion, garlic mustard, cuckoo flower, which is the other food plant for the orange tip butterfly. Um, honesty, forget me not, bugle, bird's foot trefoil. Those are just a few that would be nice for wildlife in the spring. And then a few summer plants here. And very common plants like red and white clover, really good for bees. Um, things like chives, um, lavender, marjoram, some really nice herbs that would be nice in that little sensory garden maybe, or in some pots outside the door. They'll be really good for wildlife as well. And our thyme that we said earlier. Honeysuckle is great for moths at night um, because that's why you can smell it in the evening. It attracts those moths. Um, so yeah, a whole variety of plants there. Just having a look at the question. No, so Wendy, Wendy asked, is garlic mustard the same as wild garlic? It's not actually, they are different plants. So, so yeah, wild garlic is sometimes called ramsons and that grows in woodland um, <clears throat> around the time that sort of bluebells are um, starting to flower, I believe. So quite an early spring one. But the garlic mustard is, is different. It's in the cabbage family, that one, and it it sort of pops up everywhere. So, so they are both edible, but very, both different, different plants. Um, so autumn, few plants that you might consider for the autumn. Um, teasel, lovely seed heads. Knapweed is actually really important for wildlife. That flowers quite late in the summer <clears throat> and the seeds are really beneficial. We've got things like flea, bla flea bane, thistles, Devil's bit scabious. Sedum, that flowers very, very late actually. I had some in the garden and that's quite good for pollinators. And buddleia, good old buddleia. You can sort of uh, cut your buddleia down 
And when you do that, depending on the time of year, you can actually, um, you can decide whether you want it to flower spring or whether you want it to, to flower late in the autumn. Um, so you can cut it down at the right time to, to encourage it to flower when you want it to, if you see what I mean. So Budley is pretty tough. It doesn't mind being coppiced because it then does shoot back up again. Um, and winter, ivy, as I've mentioned, is great. It's good to have some shrubs with berries, um, a bit of shelter as well. And we would always suggest leaving the summer growth um, and not cutting that back because if it's hollow, for example, some of those hollow stems, you'll find that insects like ladybirds will be hibernating inside those stems. So it's nice to leave those um, and provide some good cover for things that overwinter. Oh, I think I possibly just missed one. Yes, so again, this is another wildlife watch sheet, which is nice for the children. And that just lists um, some spring, summer and autumn plants, which would be nice to have in a bee and butterfly garden. So something nice that the children can look at. So other habitats. Um, so what else could we do in a small area? Well, log piles are very good. And, you know, I've just put this picture of rotten apples on the ground there because actually that they are really great for birds. You know, we left a lot of apples outside on the lawn and the blackbirds at the moment particularly are really enjoying them. If we eat an apple indoors, then we tend to save the core and put that out for the birds. Um, we've even had a red wing in the garden feeding on apples. So it's great to leave fallen apples. And in the autumn, they're very good for butterflies um, and other insects as well. So it's nice to leave those. And the log piles are really good for a range of invertebrates. And the log piles are really good for the children to be able to have a look under and see what they can find. You'll often find a number of different beetles, for example. You might even find some amphibians. You might find some newts if you're lucky. If you've got a pond nearby, you might find toads and frogs. So log piles are really, really nice to have. Um, and obviously it's good to put them back once you've had a look to see what's underneath. And this really just shows that you don't need huge space. You don't need a huge area to make a difference. So we've got window boxes on this top left and along in those window boxes we can I can certainly see some lavender there you know and as I said you can put a range of herbs that would be useful for us but also really nice for wildlife passing by and we've got some nice bug hotels in the picture here so the bug hotels are you know made with hollow generally hollow stems are put in there things like bamboo actually um, is quite good but bamboo is extremely tough and very very hard to cut I've discovered so I came across somebody who was trying to clear some bamboo that had taken over his garden and he very kindly gave me some so that I could use it for making bug hotels but I just couldn't cut it I ended up having to use an electric saw of a neighbour to cut it it was so amazingly tough so you can see that they are really good for a lot of different insects. So a whole variety of things. Elder is quite a good um, shrub because it has quite very soft pith within the twig. So you can hollow it out quite easily um, with tent pegs or something. And that's really, really good to make small insect homes. You don't need to make a really big bug hotel like in the picture you can actually just make a very small hotel, call it a hotel, but you can just bunch hollow sticks together and tie them together. And that can just be hung up somewhere out in the school grounds. And that's a very, very easy, small insect home. And there is actually a watch leaflet that describes how you make both the tiny one and the big bug hotel. So those watch leaflets are really good. Um, just have a quick look at the question. Can you make a bug house in a tin can? Oh, that's a good question. Um, very good question. 
I've, no, I've not known anybody to make one in a tin can before. I'm just trying to think with a, it might not be breathable. So I don't know whether it would need to be breathable. They tend to be made of wood because then they're quite breathable, I guess. But I um, don't know. No, sorry, it wasn't a question. You can. Oh, you can. OK, sorry, you're telling me you can make a bug house in a tin can. OK. OK, so, well, maybe you can then. Yeah. Um, and then I guess you put your hollow, you put your hollow sticks inside there, do you, perhaps, for them to, to go in and use? I've not come across that one before. OK, so let's move on to this. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we've got more more bug hotels. And somebody did say to me, again, you can be a little bit innovative. You don't have to make a big bug hotel like this. But if you have got a fence that you're not too precious about, you can actually just drill some holes in your fence. You know, you can actually drill holes in wood that's already standing and that will serve the same purpose. It will allow those insects to get inside there. Um, a lot of them made with pallets. You know, I've made one with pallets before and we were we were donated the pallets so they can be um, quite easily got hold of. And then we've just used whatever you can find in the way of hollow sticks and straw and goodness knows what that go inside there. So that's really good. So yes, lots, some examples of some of the beetles and bugs and things that you might find. There's a cardinal beetle just there on the left and a cockchafer on the right. So great learning opportunities for the children. And yes, yeah, so decaying wood is really, really good. So quite often it's handy to sort of bury the logs, partially bury them and help them to break down. And that can be really, really good for a range of different insects. And leaving the stumps of old trees. So if you cut down a tree that was perhaps dangerous or diseased, if you leave the stumps, then that's really good as well. Um, you know, you may even, if you're lucky, end up with stag beetle larvae. If you've got some old oak that's rotting down perhaps. And stag beetles are amazing. You know, the larvae live for, I think, about seven years eating through this wood. And then they emerged, you know, into this amazing large, large um, stag beetle, which is very impressive for, for people to see. And you could make it your log pile as part of a feature. Doesn't need to be a really untidy pile if you don't want it to be. You could make it part of a feature. You can see on the right hand side here. There's some plants growing in the planter just in front of your pile of logs behind it. So log piles are very good. Um, and again, we've got um, some hidey holes here. So another wildlife watch activity sheet um, with things that you can do with the children in the school grounds. So you could possibly make, you know, hidey holes for amphibians. Um, you could make a little area for a hedgehog. I mean, really, for hedgehogs, you just need a big pile of leaves or sort of um, twigs that you may have, if you've been sort of pruning a hedge, for example, if you just leave a pile of twigs or branches, then you might find that hedgehogs will hibernate underneath there. You might find other small mammals will go under there as well. So and then you've got another idea here for mini beasts on the right hand side. So, again, another really handy wildlife watch sheet that gives you some ideas of things that you can do. So um, bird and bat boxes, those are obviously great to have in the school grounds if you can. So you just need to sort of think about which species you're trying to attract. Um, think about where you might site them because some creatures are obviously territorial and you don't want to put it somewhere where they're going to be very, very vulnerable to predation. Um, and we tend to suggest cleaning them out each year just to make sure there are no parasites left behind. This picture on the left there, that would be a bat box because the bats will come down and they'll swoop underneath and there'll be a slit underneath that box there where they can go up inside. If you have bat boxes, it's quite nice to, if you have them on a tree, for example, it's quite nice to have two or three around the tree 
because if they're roosting in there in the day, they will actually move around depending on where the sun is so that they are the right temperature. So it's nice to have two or three boxes around the same tree. So that's quite good. So bird and bat boxes. And then obviously you could sort of do a bat evening where you take bat detectors out to see what you can find. Bird feeders are obviously great to have. Um, and there are many different designs. I found um, that the fat balls were being raided by the really big birds, you know, the magpies and crows and things. So what we did was bought um, one of the bird feeders that has the cage around it so that the larger birds can't just decimate them within minutes. Um, and only the smaller birds can get through that larger cage to get to the fat balls. So a range of food is really good. So we've got fat balls, mixed seed um, and peanuts, all really, really good mixture. And like I said, apples on the ground, also really good. So we tend to find things like dunnocks and robins um, and chaffinches on the ground, um, picking up the seed that's been dropped from the feeder. And then we tend to see things like the blue tits. We see nuthatch as well, which is quite nice. Um, going to the feeders and long-tailed tits really love, really, really love the fat balls at this time of year. So a mixture of food that's topped up fairly regularly should attract quite a wide variety of birds. Um, and then, you know, we've got that nice, every year there's the annual sort of bird survey, which the children could get involved in and have a go at doing, looking out and seeing which species of birds are visiting their bird feeders. Um, so yeah, we've got some nice, very nice birds there, nice woodpecker and a missile thrush. So at the moment, the woodpeckers are just drumming. So it's starting to get towards breeding season. So they're setting up their territories. So you might hear them drumming, um, which means that they are sort of announcing that that's their territory. So compost heaps, that's another thing that's really beneficial. So compost heaps are really good habitats actually. So they're great for slow worms, for example. If you've got a really nice big compost heap and you might and you've got a pond you may even have grass snakes that would lay eggs in the compost heap which would be really quite amazing so compost heaps are really good to have and it's quite nice um, sort of to teach the children about the whole process of composting another option of course is a wormery you know that's a smaller you could get a quite a small wormery which is quite nice and then the worms are fed with the bits of you know leftover food and so on. So compost heaps are really good additions if you've got the space to have them. And then we've got other a few other ideas like a green roof, for example, that somebody has mentioned actually already. Um, and I would suggest peat-free compost is really important because we don't want to be destroying our natural peat habitat. So peat-free compost is, is the way to go. Water butts are really useful to conserve water. Um, and tend to be better than, as I say, for topping up a pond, tend to be better really than using tap water. And the other thing is maybe to consider drought resistant plants so that you don't need to water quite so much. So that's something else to consider. So um, thinking about our impact on the environment, um, so we haven't got too many more slides. I'm going to try save a little bit of time at the end for any questions that people might have or any sort of discussion. Um, so just check the time. So it's five o'clock, so I've got half an hour. So I think we've just got a few more slides and then we'll, we'll do some questions. Um, so we need to just consider if we're talking about putting in a pond, maybe talking about a wildflower area, for example, we need to consider, like somebody mentioned earlier, the effect that our activities could have on those areas and on the environment. And will it cause damage over time? Are some areas going to be more vulnerable than other areas? And how can we reduce that impact? So really what we need to do, I've put a list on the right hand side here of some things that we might want to consider. So 
if so we talked about the wildflower meadow and it might be advisable to let it rest and remain undisturbed at certain times so it's important to monitor the effect um, that we're having on it really and it could be that you've got the space to rotate around different areas so that you can leave some areas undisturbed for a time if you don't have that it might be that we need to restrict the access and we need to explain why we're doing that because we need to let plants and animals rest and have some time without us disturbing them um, and the weather will make a difference as I said if it's very very wet then it will be much more prone to being trampled so we might need to leave it alone um, when it's very very wet so we just would need to monitor that area and it might be that you might say well we can't walk on the meadow at the moment but we can walk around the outside and if we don't want to go you know sweeping our nets through because we feel like we've done that a bit too much lately then you know what you can just get the children to walk along the outside and just to observe you know sometimes I find that even I would just go outside you know and I would just look you don't necessarily need to be sweeping your net through to try and catch everything you can just walk along the edge and you can just stop and look and you can just gently lift up leaves and see what's underneath and maybe the children could have a little magnifying pot with a lid and a paintbrush because you know you can just brush very gently with your paintbrush any creature that you find so that you don't damage it into that pot with the magnifying lid and just have a close look and maybe those children have got some id sheets with some pictures of some of those creatures and they can have a go are working out what they've got and then very gently put it back again and that really is minimal disturbance now I've certainly done that with children before and when they've left you wouldn't know that they'd been there because we didn't go walking through the area we didn't use sweet nets we just walked along the edge and had a look and actually sometimes it's just really nice to do that because I find that when you give them all a sweet net you know they just want to start doing this don't they and it becomes a bit of a mad free-for-all so sometimes it's best to hold back that equipment and just to get them using their eyes and their ears and just walking and looking to see what they can see so that would be a good way to rest your wildflower meadow i would say and i think that's the best way to see things just stop and look so, so we've mentioned rotating the location around. Now, conversely, if you are doing a campfire regularly, for example, or if you've got a mud kitchen, then those sort of things, I would stick to the same area because campfires obviously are quite destructive. So you don't really want to be having a campfire in lots of different spots because you'll end up with lots of burnt bits of ground and you know um, very nutritious as well and lots of nettles and, and things will come back where you were so I would stick to one area that area will be your camp area and obviously you, you might have your log circle around it so you wouldn't want to move that around anyway but it's always best to keep your fire site in the same spot and a mud kitchen which will be very very trampled presumably and very muddy um, again I'd keep in the same spot and somewhere that isn't sensitive for wildlife somewhere that you don't mind being trampled regularly thinking we've got to think about the weather different times of year um, there'll be different impacts on the area it's always nice to maintain some undisturbed refuge areas for wildlife as I mentioned earlier for example one side of the pond or the back of the pond it's nice to say that nobody ever goes around there that's for the wildlife and that's where you might have your log piles that they don't look at and that's where the creatures can go and not be disturbed so you might have your access um, maybe a boardwalk at the front and that's where the children can go to do their pond dipping but they can't go around the back because that's for the wildlife that's quite a nice thing to do and really the main way is just surveying and doing regular surveys so monitoring to make sure that we aren't damaging the area that we're looking at that we're studying just to make sure that the creatures are are still there the wildflowers are still there um, 
and seek advice if, if you need to. Um, the Wildlife Trust, for example, was very happy to offer advice and promoting awareness within the school um, of the importance of wildlife and protecting all of this wildlife. Um, I was once at a school where, um, unbelievably, there was actually um, a stag beetle, an adult stag beetle in the school grounds whilst I was there to do some activities with the children. And two or three of the children suddenly panicked and started trying to kill it, you know, right in front of me, started bashing it. And I was saying, no, 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 stop, stop. And, you know, the head teacher was really appalled, actually. So what was really great is that straight after that, they did an assembly, which was all about why that wasn't the right thing to do and all about, you know, protecting the creatures that we have here um, and not being afraid of them because they're not not going to hurt you if you don't if you don't touch them, you know. And um, yeah, so it turned out that that became quite a good learning opportunity so promoting environmental awareness I think at school is really important so just move on yeah so these were the sort of before and after that I thought it might be nice to show you now I know that this isn't school grounds but it could be couldn't it it could be a part of your school grounds it really is just a very small concrete courtyard here with not much in it so just to, to so show what you can do in a very small space, we've got these little um, raised bed along here. So this could be an area where you plant, you know, your sunflowers at the back, maybe, or things that will climb up, maybe honeysuckle, perhaps. And then you could have some of your herbs and your wildflowers that are good for wildlife at the front there. There we've got sweet peas. We've got a whole mixture of things that have been planted in there. Um, and then they took the paving up, obviously, and decided they were going to sow wildflower seed. So that became the wildflower meadow that I showed you earlier with all the pots down the side there. Now, interesting, just worth noting that if you want to sow wildflower seed and you sow annual seed, for example, poppies, then those poppies won't come back the next year unless the ground is disturbed again. So, you know, we've got a, a nature reserve, Barton Meadows in, in Winchester. And the first year that we converted this to um, a wildflower meadow, it had been arable land, agricultural land. It was a mass of poppies. And then people said, oh, the following year, people said, oh, I want to see the poppies. What time of year will the poppies be there? Well, of course, the following year, there were no poppies at all because the ground wasn't disturbed that year so instead the perennials came up so things like the oxide daisies um, and over time we've now got a lovely wildflower meadow there but a lot of people um, plant annuals and then think that they'll just come back but they actually need that ground disturbance for the annuals to come back and they need the seed you know to be dropped into the ground there because they only live for a year but if you plant a mixture of perennials, then you'll have your wildflower meadow that you can just mow and clear each year and manage as a sort of wildflower meadow, perennial wildflower meadow. So somebody needs to go. OK, that's fine. Thanks for letting me know. I hope it's been useful um, and it will be online so you can look at it again and I'll send it through as well. So we're nearly, nearly done. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so these were just a couple of examples of things in that garden. So a very pretty little moth. And I can't remember the Latin name for the moth. And we've got some also um, nice solitary bees and wasps that will be burrowing into the ground there. So um, I think we are almost at the end. So yes, yeah, survey and monitoring, really important to do that. Um, because it, it, it's learning for the children and it also informs you as to whether you're managing the area in the right way for wildlife. And there are all these different ways in which you can do that. We can use Longworth traps, um, which are very obviously humane 
small mammal traps so you can see what creatures you've got living there. You trap them the night before with food and bedding and everything, and then you release them first thing in the morning. You might want to consider nest boxes with cameras. You might want to consider sweet nets, which we've, we've mentioned, and the bug pots with the magnifying lids. Um, you, so do, so some, Wendy says, do you need a license for the Longworth traps? You don't, you just need, um, if you are going to be handling shrews, you do actually need to get a certificate to do that because shrews are very susceptible to stress. So, um, but I, I did that and it was quite easy to do through the ecology team at the Wildlife Trust, um, <clears throat> but I didn't need any other license to set the Longworth traps. Um, no, not in the same way that you do for some of the protected species like great crested newts and things like that. Um, so we've got sweet nets, a torch is useful. Um, if you go out in the evening, that's the time to look in the pond for newts um, and you take your torch and you'll see them because they're quite active at night. So, but also, you know, you can go out and see all kinds of things, can't you, at night. Moth traps are really good things to do. Reptile felt, so, you know, like corrugated iron or a bit of felt on the ground is quite nice. You can have a little peek underneath and see whether you've got any reptiles. Uh, pond dipping, taking photographs, brilliant, you know, over time, bit of fixed point photography, and obviously just sitting watching and enjoying. Okay, so, um, the last few slides, just to acknowledge that really this training has been developed um, through our South Downs Education Network, um, which has got over 100 centres and sites in the South Downs delivering activities to schools. And these are some of the things that this network offers. Lots of curriculum linked sessions and activities listed here obviously residential trips are not possible at the moment but there is online some online learning instead um so yeah so by taking part today um we've helped build learning outside the classroom obviously you know we all benefit from this really it's really really important um and here are a few other links which might be useful Something I just made a note to make sure that I do let you know um, is that there is a travel grant available for schools with more than 10% of pupils eligible for free school meals. There is a travel grant available within the South Downs National Park, which will cover costs of up to £300 if you visit a site or a centre within the South Downs National Park. So that's definitely worth mentioning. So. There will be more information about the centres and the providers and the teaching resources and things on some of these, these um, links here. So I think um, that might be my last slide. Yes, it is. So I'll stop sharing there. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've got 15 minutes left. So if anybody has got any questions or anything that you wanted me just to go over, then um, I'm very happy to. I'm just going to take a quick photo of all the names so that I make sure I have got all of you so I can send you the PowerPoint. I will assume you'd like it unless I don't, unless you put that you don't in the chat. So has anyone got any questions at all or anything they want to share? I'm just checking the chat. So I see a couple of people have had to leave the teaching and so on. Oh, that's good. Thank you. That's great. That's great. That's good. So yeah, I mean, if um, I'll send this around. So, and I always say to people, if you've got any questions any other time, feel free to email me. I'm very happy to receive emails. Shall I put my email in the uh, chat so that you can see it? Susan.Simmons at 
www.hiwwt.org.uk. Yeah, so if anybody wanted to contact me with any questions, you're very welcome. So much, oh, that's good, great. Good, well, hopefully it just gives sort of brief, I don't know, a brief overview really of some of the things that you can do from small to a bit bigger, really. It's hard to sort of fit it all in. Um, and I like to save a bit of time at the end, just in case. Um, so Wendy says, I used to have a Digi Blue microscope. Is there a useful one for taking out into the field? I, I don't know, I need to look that up actually. I don't, I haven't taken one out into the field, if I'm honest. Um, so that's a good question. But I can get back to you actually, Wendy, because maybe I always say to people, if I don't know the answer, one of my colleagues will. So um, I will ask good microscope to take out. Funnily enough, I've been, um, oh, it links to the computer. And you can take photos, okay, out to field. I'll see if I can see which, if my colleagues use any outside. Unbelievably, I've been using one inside and figured out that so much you can do online. I've been down to my local stream, taken a sample of some of the invertebrates and I managed to hook up a microscope to my laptop. So I've been able to share pictures, you know, of the, of the creatures um in the tray which was really great it's funny when you're um having to stay indoors because of covid the amount of things that you find that you can actually do online it's quite surprising oh that's good okay so do i know the name of the lens to put on my phone camera oh now i can't remember the name but basically it was um it was on Amazon and it was, I think, $8.99. And it's a little tiny clip and there are three lenses. There's a fisheye lens, a very a macro lens, and maybe a wide angle. The other one, I can't remember. I only ever used the macro one. And I just literally clip it onto my um, camera there. And then you just hold it very, very close to the creature that you're looking at. And it is amazing. It really shows so much detail for, for the price. I think it's really good. I think it's universal as well. So it fits onto lots of different um, lots of different phones. I can send you the link to it, actually. I'm quite happy to do that. Link to phone lens. There we go. I don't think I've missed anything in the chat. No. Anybody got any other questions? No. So we'll be um, on the YouTube channel and um, on the Southdowns website as well. And I will send WeTransfer so that everybody can see the slides and get that information. So, well, I guess if nobody's got any other questions, then we may as well finish, do you think? Any last questions? No? Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much, it's been really helpful. Great, thank you. And good luck with your all your school grounds. <laughs>